Um, I'm going to touch very briefly on who Pernod Ricard are and who Pernod Ricard winemakers are, as that may not be evident to everybody in the room. Then around the benefits um, and some of the risks associated with GIs, and like I said, move very quickly into the consumer view, uh, and which hopefully will be of value for your industry. Uh, Pernod Ricard, essentially we're the second largest drinks company in the world. You may not know Pernod Ricard as a name, but you may well be familiar with some of our brands, Jameson, Absolute, Chivas, uh, Malibu even, so across, across that portfolio. Uh, and some of the brands are here to see. When it comes to wine, uh, we are 1,700 people globally, but over 1,000 people based in Australia, be that in the Barossa Valley in South Australia, but also Sydney, where I am based. Uh, and we have a portfolio of wine from around the world. And just to bring that to life a little bit more, here's a short video. Okay, that's, that's enough about who we are, but in, in essence, that was also just to underline that we do a lot of hard work in sales and marketing, we do a lot of hard work in strategy, but first and foremost, and as the person in charge of our graduate program with our new graduates, I'm always the first to emphasise we are an agricultural business first and foremost. It starts in the vineyard, it starts with our growers, it starts with our winemakers, and that's very important to us, because without that product, we're, everything else is superfluous. Um, to the topic at hand, um, in terms of uh, GIs, a definition for us all with the risk of um, teaching you all to suck eggs, we're talking about specific territories, regions or localities uh, and defining those regions uh, and uh, in being specific about where your product is from. Um, in a wine sense, again, some of the names you will be very familiar with uh, come to bear. So we might be talking about southeastern Australia, uh, in, in the largest sense, through to the Brossa Valley, where Jacobs Creek and St Hugo are made, uh, and then also further afield to places like Hawke's Bay, Marlborough, even Rioja, where we play, but even Champagne. So again, names you're familiar with, I'm sure. But just to kind of bring that to bear for those outside of the industry is about what we mean when we talk GIs when, from a wine point of view. For, in Australia, they're relatively young, I guess, in the same way as the, the wine industry is relatively young compared to the old world, and I'll come on to that very shortly. Um, and it was enact they were enacted really to help us as an Australian industry gain access to uh, that European market and also played a part in the Label Integrity Programme. We've touched on it a bit today, there's uh, already with uh, you know, the previous session, but there's, there's, a, there's a difference, there's a tension between how we play GIs in the old world, and when we talk old world in wine, we're talking France, Spain, Italy, and the new world, countries like Australia, countries like New Zealand. 
Um, from a European perspective, as we've heard, uh, we heard from John Clark, there's a, about guarantees of quality and taste, and that plays not only for wine but for other products. Whereas from an Australian perspective, it's, it's also important about the brand, the brand that, that comes from that area, the grapes that, from that area, and, and give a bit more freedom, if you like, in terms of uh, what we can do with those GIs. In, in Europe, it's not only about the region, it's also about the process, what, which grapes you can use, which grapes you can't use, which processes you can use, which processes you're not allowed to use. But in, from an Australian perspective, there's, there's a bit more freedom with that, and it's much more about the reputation of an area. Um, and also the, uh, gives us more freedom to play with different grape varieties, different techniques, and innovate and create more, we believe. So to those benefits, um, yes, it's a marketing tool and a branding tool, and increasingly so. Um, we heard again from John Clark this morning about um, taste and quality, and I would echo that. Quality, authenticity, the characteristics of your region um, uh, can, can be brought to life more with GIs. Um, again, from a local point of view, it's easier to stop others free riding. If you're defined in your area and, and have a certain reputation, it means someone from another area with perhaps a lesser reputation can't take, can't make wines in your name. Um, and then from an international point of view, we all, we're all clear on the, on the, on the protection that, that it brings us around the world. And we also have to respect the protection that other people want to bring for their regions as they come into Australia too. There are risks associated with it. Uh, you heard earlier on again about perhaps counterfeit and you know, making sure people aren't passing off a region in, di in different areas. Um, we heard you, there's a lo very live topic right now on Prosecco, uh, which would stop Australian producers using the name here in Australia, which is a, it's a, a bit of a challenge for us. Um, to bring that to life, Prosecco up until 2009 was, uh, it was known widely as the grape variety, and that was changed to um, the less attractive sounding Glera. Uh, and uh, the, the begs that question, is it a variety, is it a region, how do we, how do we play that? Um, from an Australian perspective, we fundamentally believe it's, it's, it's a grape variety, um, and we're, it's been, the challenge has been has reared its head again. Uh, it was defended successfully by the Winemakers Federation of Australia in 2013, and as you heard earlier on, maybe that topic will come up again uh, as, these, as these discussions uh, are raised. Uh, for us, it extends beyond just Prosecco. Uh, it, it means other grape varieties, other terms. Uh, you may have heard about discussions about Parmesan, for example, in the US recently. Um, so it, it comes to bear. So from, from our perspective, it's very much we would respect a region's right to define itself as we define our own regions and protect those. But when it comes to a grape variety, we would defend our ability in Australia to use that grape because we're using it already and also taking it to market in that sense. Why is that important? Uh, and important from a commercial point of view, if nothing else. Uh, I think the, the estimates are on the Prosecco industry in Australia, the Australian Prosecco industry is worth 60 million and expected to rise to 200 million over the next couple of years as that particular part of the world boom, uh, part of the category booms. And parochially, if you like, from our perspective, we had one of the best launches of the summer with Jacobs Creek Prosecco Spritz uh, last year as well. So again, important to us and to the Australian industry. And these kind of innovations wouldn't be able to happen if we had restrictions on the grapes that we could use in Australia. I want to talk a little bit about how this is an area that perhaps doesn't see huge change, but it can change and, can, and, and new, new contenders can come in, new competition come in, can come in. Now, I do appreciate, you might think it's a bit rich for a POM to be standing here in Australia talking about English sparkling wine. Uh, but there's a serious point to this slide. Um, the English wine industry in the last tax year was worth 235 million Australian dollars um, in turnover last year. There were 64 new applications in 2016 from English producers wanting to make wine. Probably not something we'd seen coming five years ago, ten years ago. This is a Department of, Educa of Agriculture, DEFRA, tweet from December from the UK. And again, they're promoting that, that wine as well as their own produce around the world, as we would want to do from an Australian perspective. So again, an example of how regions that perhaps weren't seen as quality before, weren't seen as competition, can change and can come on the radar. And likewise, how we would want to export ourselves abroad. I'd like to move now to the consumer view where perhaps I can add the most value and perhaps you can draw the, the most parallels in terms of your own industries, uh, in terms of what we see on wine. So what do GIs actually mean for a consumer? Um, is it better quality? Should I pay more for it? Uh, is it a grape? Now, that might sound strange. I've been in enough focus groups in Europe, and particularly in the UK, where people think Rioja is a grape. 
and good luck to them. They enjoy the wine. They, they know it means something else, but they don't know exactly what it is. And you heard about that education differential in yesterday's morning session. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a real thing that, that can, can, can exist as well. Does it mean I, I need to know... I should, if I know about a GI, does it mean I know more about wine? The, I'm sure you've all met the dinner party bragger before, but that sometimes they can, uh, they can exist. And is it more likely to mean it's a real wine from a real place? From our perspective, it really helps us in this wall of wine. Anybody choosing a wine for their Friday night? In fact, some of the people I was with for dinner last night talked about how intimidating wine can be to purchase, how you're not quite sure if you've got the knowledge uh, and so on. And GIs can really help. Uh, they're one aspect that can help us get cut through in that wall of wine. It's a, it gives you a reason to buy as a consumer. It gives you a reason to be bought as a producer. Uh, and that's why we would, we would support the, the use of GIs where we can. Let's get down to the hard facts in terms of cash. Commercially, this uh, perhaps a complicated slide, but this is the Australian market. The Australian market average price for wine is $11.47 today. Um, Jacobs Creek is the leading brand in that, in that category uh, with 6% of the market. But today, what, you can, what we do know is a cr in the $10 to $15 price bracket, that was a big sweet spot of the, of the market, um, appellated wines or wines with a GI can typically command up 5% more than non-appellated wines. And as that goes up the scale to the, up to the slide here where you see 25 to, to 15 to 25 dollars, that in, those, the propensity for those appellated wines and their existence increases. So we do have hard facts from Australia uh, which shows that you can command more for your product, product and I'm sure that's the same for other industries as well. And that's why we focus very much in our campaigns on where we are from, where, which region we are from, the Made By campaign that we've shared around the world in 20 different countries talks about our Barossa heritage and where, and where it all began for us in 1847. And again, this is where I think it comes, where perhaps we can add some colour to the discussion. The legals are one thing. You can have your defined region, but you really need to tell your story in a compelling way and bring it to life in the products that you make and the, and the way you bring your marketing to bear on that provenance story. Further afield, um, this gets more challenging. And again, we heard about that education challenge yesterday. Uh, there's a lower level of knowledge of, uh, of new world wine regions around the world. And that's something to perhaps consider for your own produce as well. We shouldn't assume that because we know that region very well that everybody else around the world would know that. And when you look at the, um, the examples here, with the exception of Bordeaux and the French, um, to be fair, have done a very, very good job over years and centuries of tradition to tell that story, to become the most uh, well-known wine region in the world in many different countries uh, that we would want to export to. Um, but often it's about geography. It's about history. I've only been living in Australia for four years, even though I've been working on, on behalf of the Aussie industry for 15 uh, and I now know where some of the areas are much better because I've lived in them, I've been to them, and so on. And we mustn't forget that consumers may never come and see us. So it's how do we tell our story in a way that helps them understand where we're from um, and in that wall of wine, in that split second of purchase, and whether this is beef, whether this is cheese, whether this is wine, I'm sure it's applicable. Um, so help consumers um, navigate uh, our products and ultimately pay more for what is good quality produce. What we also know as well is, again, you might not want to know exactly the ins and outs of why that region has been defined in the way it has, but the proportion of consumers who want to know more about where their produce comes from, that trust we talked about yesterday, the interest in, in local produce, the interest of when you go on holiday, how many of you have been on holiday to a different region or a different country and enjoyed their wines? Um, often doesn't taste quite the same when you bring it home. But uh, the, uh, have you, that, those interests are there. These are macro global trends that are there to be tapped into. And again, it's how you tell your story, how you talk about where you're from that are key, that is key. And that's something we do every day. Storytelling, as we call it in our business, about where we're from and where we are from is an everyday occurrence. Here you've got Ben Bryant, our chief winemaker at Jacobs Creek. You've got Trina Smith, Blazing a Trail, as our chief white and rosé sparkling winemaker. These guys travel. It's vintage right now, but apart from that, they're around the world telling our story. When we win awards from our region, um, from the Barossa, from, from, from Australia, we take those awards around the world and we make a, we make a virtue of that as to how we tell our story. It's really important for, for us to do, and I'm sure, again, there are parallels for other industries here. 
And often there's no place like home. The cellar door tourism business is booming in, in Australia and government is very focused on that and there's some more support coming, which is great to see. We opened St Hugo in 2016, which you can see here again with, with, with fantastic support from government. Uh, and we welcome tourists from around the world to the home of St Hugo, um, from, particularly from uh, Australia, but also from China, uh, the US and many other countries. And in a similar way, Jacobs Creek has 165,000 visitors come through their door every year. Again, about 38% of those are coming from overseas. So it's another place where you can tell your story, tell, where, tell about where, you, where you're from, the, ge the geographical area that you come from, and bring that to life for consumers. And sometimes, just sometimes, we get a little bit of extra help to tell our story about where we come from. Uh, we've got a product called Jacob's Creek Double Barrel, which is a wine finished in Scotch whiskey barrels. And Chris Hemsworth, we're very lucky to have him as our partner for our latest campaign. Just three weeks ago, my team hosted him in the Barossa, and we're in the middle of vintage right now. It's tradition in the Barossa to bless the vintage by, uh, with, with your wine, and Chris thought that was a great idea. He posted that on his Instagram. One million likes, 3,000 comments in 36 hours, talking about Jacob's Creek being from the Barossa Valley. Really important in terms of telling our story and just another creative way uh, that, that can be done. They say Jacob's Creek double barrel her soul. And a soul is only as strong as the struggle it faces. Australian wilds, from northern moors, a journey to the end of the earth. See anything that grows, grows a story. Passion's a spark. And while that flame chars, it also creates. Getting home takes many hands. And just as much hope. Two barrels began this journey. One soul returned. Jacob's Creek double barrel, finished in aged whiskey barrels. Richer, deeper, smoother. So there are many different ways to tell that story, uh, and that's just one example of uh, perhaps at the highest level of how you bring provenance to life, how you bring where you're from to life, and the story of your product, and the story of where you're made. Um, all of the people in the, apart from the lady, all of the people in that film are our own uh, growers and viticulturalists as well. Um, so to wrap up, um, GIs in wine, they're important. When you've got them, it's important to protect them and defend them when they exist. And as we said earlier, as I said earlier on, from a regional point of view, uh, we respect others' um, interest in defending their regions too. Consumer interest in provenance continues to grow. It's a macro global trend for the food and beverage industry. Those GIs can help you command more for your product, as you've seen. And again, I'm sure that applies to other industries without having the statistics. Um, they reassure consumers about your quality, your authenticity, your characteristics and you tell your story to consumers in a way that gives them additional reasons to buy, or buy more often, or buy at a higher price. But, and there is a big but, only if you bring that to life of consumers. Achieving that legal status is one thing. How do you tell that story in a compelling way? Why is it important to me as a consumer? Why does it mean better? Why is it interesting? Why do I need to know about where you are from? And why is it better for me? Thank you.